Thank you very much. Uh, it is, I was asked to give this talk uh, in, um, in English, mas quero aproveitar essa oportunidade de dar as uh, boas-vindas para todos os uh, participantes do Brasil. But I'll be talking in English, and my talk uh, this evening is on semiotics, uh, archaeology, and the evolution of human language. And we'll see that the evidence suggests that human language goes back to the lower Paleolithic over a million years ago. I would like to thank um, several people for uh, their help in, in this talk and running some of my ideas past them, especially Professor Larry Barham of the University of Liverpool Department of Archaeology. Larry and I have been working together for several months now, um, and his specialty is uh, Homo erectus uh, archaeology. I'd also like to thank Ted Gibson, uh, Jeff Pullum, Steve Piantadosi, Ray Jackendoff, Evelina Federenko, John Shea, Phil Lieberman, and many others for comments on various versions of this. Um, a summary of this talk is um, language is an invented cognitive technology. The core of language is semiosis, which we'll explain as we go along, not structure. My definition of language and a definition that actually goes back um, over um, uh, about 800 years, 600, 700 years, language is the transfer of information via symbols. Language by this definition is not grammar, nor is grammar a particularly significant component of language by this particular view, although grammar certainly plays a role in language. Language evolved gradually in symbiosis with human cultures. Language was not the result of any special mutation. In other words, there was no Prometheus. The evolution of language subsequent to its invention depends indirectly on human biology, though language itself is a cultural artifact. The evidence for language is found in archeology. span Tools show semiosis and advanced communication. Settlements show hierarchical thinking. Sailing shows communication, values, knowledge structures, and social roles. Taken together, this all provides nearly overwhelming evidence that Homo erectus had language. Language evolution further reflects what I refer to as the Persian project progression. Um, we see the origin, the initial uh, emergence of icons and indexes followed by symbols, which gets us to language. Much of this talk, but certainly not all of it, comes from a recent book of mine, How Language Began. So as we start to think about language, language is a biocultural behavior. Research into its origins is necessarily, therefore, an interdisciplinary exercise. Models of language origins typically integrate social, cognitive, anatomical, and genetic data with broad comparative perspectives drawn from ethology, while archaeology provides the critical time depth for model building. Although there is widespread agreement that symbols are crucial to language, there is profound disagreement on what constitutes language and when it evolved. So in order to be able to tell any story about the evolution of language, we need to draw from various disciplines. We need evidence from uh, archaeology. We need evidence from linguistics and field research on contemporary languages. We need to know something about the range of diversity among human languages before we can talk intelligently about its evolution. We need to know something about semiotics, comparative biology, philosophy, cognitive science, paleo neuroscience, neuroscience, evolutionary theory, and genetics. So it's a huge endeavor to talk about the evolution of language. Um, and when I talk about the evolution of language, I'm talking about going from no language whatsoever to having language. I'm not talking about changes language, languages go through once they're established. Um, so what is language? One definition of language is that it is, it is a set of sentences described by a recursive grammar. Another definition uh, is that it is the transfer of information via symbols. And, and we'll have to look at how, which definition best, best fits the evidence. Who has language? All entities in the world, arguably even minerals communicate. My thermostat takes in information from the environment 
temperature and outputs uh, change in my heating system uh, or my air conditioning system. So even in a sense, minerals communicate, but only humans appear to have language. So what is the relationship between communication and language? If we look at communication in any species, uh, there are signs that provide information to plants. So for example, as the days get shorter in the Northern hemisphere or, or, or far South in the Southern hemisphere, uh, trees start to, deciduous trees start to lose their leaves. The shortening of the days is a sign. It's interpreted by the trees which lose their leaves. Language is the transfer of information via an open cl class set of symbols. So Sewer's dyadic semiotics lacks a crucial distinction between symbols and signs. Thus here we invoke the triadic theory of semiotics of Charles Sanders Peirce. There are, Peirce proposed a number of signs over 66 in different publications, but the three that are most important to us here are icons, indexes, and symbols. An icon is a sign that corresponds to its referent based on inherent properties of the sign and referent exploited by an interpreter. So a photograph corresponds visually, a painting, a diagram, blueprints, tree structures that are drawn by same tacticians are icons of sentences that are spoken. An index is a sign connected physically to its reference. So footprints are connected physically to the thing that made the footprint, the smoke, to fire, smells, to the thing that made the smell. Pointing, when I point my finger, creates an imaginary line that goes to the thing I'm pointing at. So indexes are connected physically to their reference. Symbols are signs that refer to an object by convention, habit, or rule. Animals can have symbols, but do not create them productively. Productivity requires culture. Bird dialects might use symbols, but are not languages because they lack open-ended symbol creation. Um, it, I never want to say, it's always difficult to say that no creature has X. When we look at the gradual uh, form of evolution uh, throughout uh, the history of the world, Darwinian evolution by natural selection, um, and a few other components of evolution that Darwin hadn't anticipated, um, we never want to be in the situation of saying only humans have X. This almost always turns out to be wrong. But what it does, what does turn out to be the case very often is humans have X, say, language um, in the highest form. Um, so what, is a, what does it mean to say that a symbol can be formed by convention? Dog means canine because English speakers agree that it does. John is a nice guy is a symbol. Um, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That syllogism is itself a symbol. So symbols can be quite complex. They're not just individual words or uh, gestures and things like that. They can be quite complex. Uh, the question is whether language appeared gradually or suddenly. The threshold to, pro to productive symbols was brief, a cultural invention. But the evolution of the platforms for language, and I talk about these platforms in language, the cultural tool, such as the growth of the brain to give us more cognitive power, uh, powerful memory, working short-term, long-term memories, perception to be able to distinguish background and foreground, focus, sociality, etc. These took evolutionary time and many originated prior to Homo our genus. According to this view, language has existed for 60,000 plus generations or more than 1 million years. In the time that we have together this evening, I'm gonna tell you why I believe this. An alternative popular view is the idea that language is the result of a mutation that occurred about 100,000 years ago and produced the ability to generate recursive, also binary branching endocentric language or sentences. We will see that there's no need to invoke such proposals in explaining human language origins. We also need to be clear on the difference between speech and language. Speech is secondary, language is primary. There are languages that can be whistled, hummed, or spoken with very few sounds. Um, computers, for example, which can express anything that we can express, um, get by with only two sounds, zero and one. Uh, binary bits, so a large inventory is unnecessary. 
Pitaha, the language I've worked on the longest, um, has eight consonants for men, two tones, and three vowels. And we know, however, that the smaller the number of uh, sounds that a language has, distinctive uh, phonological sounds, um, the small number is paradigmatic simplicity, and that always entails syntagmatic complexity. So for Pitaha, which has a small number of sounds, the words tend to be longer. Um, they don't have to always be longer, but uh, there are lots of different trade-offs. So who had speech? What creatures had the capability of modern human speech? There are researchers today that argue that many animals had the capacity for modern human speech. But I want to say that it really doesn't matter if they did or did not, as we see directly. What is perhaps the principal hallmark of modern human speech? Philip Lieberman has argued in a series of publications that it's the quantal vowels, E, A, U. And he claims these are the driving forces behind a lot of the evolution of our vocal apparatus. Um, they're found in all of the world's languages. They're the easiest to hear. Um, but were they there before language or did they come after language? Uh, there's, there's, there are different perspectives. Uh, Jeffrey Lightman of uh, Mount Sinai Medical School and Phil Lieberman of Brown University have argued that uh, rapid e evolution of speech properties began with Homo erectus. Tecumseh Fitch has argued that, um, that Homo erectus probably had modern speech capabilities. Uh, it really doesn't matter for the account that I'm going to tell. And the reason for that is once you have symbols, you don't need that many sounds to communicate the symbols. The sounds make symbol transmission more uh, effective, but as we'll see in just a second, sounds are, um, are enhancements to the sim semiosis of language. There are also external conditions on the evolution of speech. Damien Blasi, Sean Rogers, and Caleb Everett all argue for exocentric ec ecological factors affecting speech evolution. And you're going to hear a talk, I believe, from Caleb Everett uh, coming up. So this is the hero of our story, Homo erectus. I like this particular artist's rendition. You see still some archaic features of Homo erectus. You see the uh, pronounced brow ridges and the shorter forehead and the prognathous um, uh, mouth. Um, but by and large, Homo erectus uh, was a human like us. Any, any creature that belonged to the genus Homo is a human. Who was Homo erectus? Homo erectus lived about from the period of about 1.8 million years ago to 140,000 years ago. So easily the most successful species in the history of the genus Homo. They they walked the earth far longer than Homo sapiens have, and they walked the earth far longer than Neanderthals did. Um, and in fact, as we'll see, we are Homo erectus. Those of us who are alive today basically are Homo erectus. Um, Homo erectus ranged in height from about 172 centimeters to 181 centimeters. So they were not short. They were tall, uh, human, normal human size uh, creatures. Uh, their brains were a bit smaller than Homo sapiens, about 950 cc's on average, which overlaps in range with some European sapiens females, um, which means that uh, since we know that that European females with 950 cc brains are just as smart as uh, sapiens males with 1200 to 1500 size brains, usually around 1250 cc's, uh, that size doesn't completely matter in these things. In fact, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals had brains larger than sapiens. Their brains averaged about 100 cc's to 150 cc's larger than Homo sapiens brains from what we can tell. Homo erectus was a wide ranging polymorphic species. It arguably possessed uh, modern vocal apparatus. Uh, it was an ocean traveler, a tool maker, a culture possessing inventor, controlled fire, lived in communities. Most cognitively advanced creature to have ever walked the earth aside from Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, far superior in intelligence to any gorilla or any other living animal today. Um, so um, we'll just skip down to the last point here. The two, the two major distinctions 
in discussing the origins of language are the rationalist and the realist, the Cartesian and the non-Cartesian. Chomsky represents, for example, the rationalist or Cartesian uh, perspective on the nature of human language, that it's somehow innate in the species. The realist, um, we could say the empiricist, but actually it's, it's uh, more accurate to talk about realism as, as an alternative. And realism um, entails a world that we can actually study and that, uh, as Peirce would say, nothing gets into the brain but through the senses. Um, so the evolution of the brain, if we look at Homo sapiens or Homo erectus's brain, um, the range that we know of is in the circle. Homo sapiens is uh, to the right and, and much higher. So it has very much larger brain sizes <laughs> than Homo erectus. But we do see that Homo erectus falls within the range of, um, it's, it's not that far below Homo sapiens and in fact uh, approaches the size of Homo sapiens uh, depending on the population in the world. Body size can affect brain size, but, but the brain size is not so important. The most important thing about the brain is not the size, but as I point out in the book, How Language Began, it's the organization of the brain. Homo floresiensis, um, another creature we'll see some evidence for, um, had much smaller brains, brains about the size of Australopithecines, or chimpanzees, in other words, about 450 cc's. So if we take three creatures that had 450 cc to 500 cc brains, um, modern chimpanzees, Australopithecus africanus and Homo floresiensis, we see tremendous differences in the intelligence of each of these creatures uh, that is unrelated to the total number, you know, just the raw brain size. So raw brain size tells us something, but it's not absolutely crucial. We also know from recent research, a paper that was just published in Nature Neuroscience this year, that um, the auditory pathways that underlie speech are at least 25 million years old. So um, although speech is not the same as language, we do know that language and the different facilities that make language possible go back for millions of years prior to the appearance of humans on the planet. Um, uh, Evelina Federengo's language network is also important. You've heard a talk from her, so I'm going to um, just give this uh, brief uh, representation that uh, going across speakers and across languages, across genders, and in the hundreds of subjects that uh, Evelina has tested in her lab at MIT, um, that um, language tends to be found in, in certain areas across all species. Um, I've joked with Ev that she should probably do a test now to see where cooking is stored in the brain. Um, everything we know is stored someplace in the brain and these tend to be fairly specific. And as Ev said in her talk, this in no way, the fact that we find language stored in specific regions of the brain uh, in no way um, is, a, is support for the idea that language is innate. It's a, it's a fairly neutral uh, fact. It's just an interesting fact to know where language is stored. And I discuss this a lot more in the book in terms of language deficits and language lesions, uh, effects of language. Um, the human ancestry, uh, a recent model is that, you know, you see erectus going through it all. If you follow down below 2 million years, you see erectus and floresiensis probably merge, but erectus then evolved into Heidelbergensis and Neanderthals and sapiens and Denisovans. Um, so when we talk about the disappearance of Erectus, even though there was a period of time, 150,000 years ago, Sapiens, Neanderthals, and Erectus all walked the earth at the same time, um, we are uh, the Erectus that survived. We are the most successful branch of the Erectus tree. So Sapiens, um, modern Sapiens evolved from Erectus. Now, to be able to understand semiotics and its role in the evolution of human language, I need to say just a little bit about the founder of semiotics, which is Charles Sanders Peirce. Peirce invented formal first and second order logic with existential and universal quantification before Frege. He invented semiotics before Saussure. He invented pragmatism before William James. He was considered America's greatest mathematician at the time. He was the first American to offer a theory of universal grammar, which he explicitly called universal grammar in 1865. 
He was responsible for fundamental discoveries in mathematics, psychology, chemistry, geology, astronomy, and other fields. Although he's known as a philosopher, he made his living for most of his life as a geophysicist. Um, arguably, he was the first person to develop uh, a modern theory of cognitive science as we understand it today. And Peirce, uh, this is Peirce in his 20s. He had a very interesting life, which I'm uh, enjoying writing about in the biography I'm preparing about Peirce. But to have semiosis, and we still haven't defined it, um, but I will, we will be defining semiosis, we need a theory of culture. Culture contains two components, dark matter of the mind and a set of ranked values, social roles, and hierarchical knowledge structures. Um, in my book, Dark Matter of the Mind, I define dark matter of the mind as any knowledge unspoken in normal circumstances, usually unarticulated even to ourselves, it may be ineffable. Uh, dark matter of the mind emerges from acting, from languaging, from culturally, culturing as we learn conventions and knowledge organization and adopt values and value rankings. It is shared and it is personal. It comes via emicization which is a term we get from Pike. That is, we learn to classify the world according to a particular cultural system. It is composed of apperceptions, which is a term that Rene Descartes uh, introduced into philosophy, but was also taken up by John Locke, Charles Peirce, William James, and many others, uh, and memory, and thereby produces our sense of self. Dark matter of the mind is found in some degree with any sentient creature, but would have become far more salient with Erectus due to Erectus's greater powers of cognition. And that's developed in this book of mind, Dark Matter of the Mind. Um, so what is culture? Culture is an abstract network shaping and connecting social roles, hierarchically structured knowledge domains and ranked values. Culture is dynamic, it's shifting, it's reinterpreted moment by moment. Culture is only found in the bodies and behaviors of its members. Culture is not found in a group, except as the overlapping mental dark matter of the group's members. So as we go through life as individuals in a particular group, we have similar experiences, we have similar interpretations, we develop similar values, and to the degree that these overlap, we call this overlapping, these overlapping dark matters a culture. But everybody has, in fact, their own individual values, and culture is, is an abstraction across various individuals uh, and the dark matter of each individual's mind. So next we get to universal grammar. It may surprise some to hear that I actually believe in universal grammar. I just don't believe it has anything to do with the universal grammar of Chomsky. The origins of the idea of universal grammar um, include properties of signification and neither nature nor nurture. So for Peirce, his view of universal grammar has nothing to do with genes. It has nothing to do with culture. It is all about um, uh, properties of semiosis. Uh, but I, I will point out as we go along that in fact, semiosis has to take place in a culture so that the individual symbols that get created reflect the culture. The other notion of UG, universal grammar, is that language is enabled not merely by genes, but by language specific genes. Uh, but I, to this, I will say that no one, no researcher denies that language is based on biology. I certainly do not. But that's not the question. The question is not whether language is based on biology. The question is whether anything in human biology is specific to language. And there the answer appears to be no. Uh, though I wouldn't say that too strongly. We, there's a lot to learn about all of this stuff. Both universal grammars, that of Peirce and that of Chomsky, have recursion. Peirce's universal grammar has semiotic recursion. Chomsky's um, theory has syntactic recursion. The crucial issue is whether language is mainly about form or meaning. Syntax, by the way, is found widely in the natural world, wherever any two or more entities are organized systematically, you have syntax. So searching for symbols. If symbols are necessary and sufficient conditions for language, as I have claimed and claim here, evidence for them is therefore crucial to establishing when language began. And the first place to look is in the artifacts that we have from archaic humans, their tools. The importance of tools is hard to overstress. Uh, Tools are social conventions, individual devices or processes 
that meet perceived needs of individuals' communities, uh, such as shovels, iPhones, ropes, golf clubs, mathematics. These are all tools. Tools are a set of devices, processes, and expertise used to harness the properties of a particular material. Full culturally constructed repertoire of knowledge, conventions, devices, and processes can also be considered a tool. Values are vital at each stage and level of tool construction and tool use. Uh, Larry Barham and I have worked on human technology and its evolution and its rel relevance to cognition, as have, in fact, many other people. Uh, so tools enmesh the material with the ideational. They put our ideas into, into form. They exemplify social constructivism, what we do as a society. And tool construction, human technology renders tools symbols. As a society's tools emerge from the values, knowledge, structures, and social roles of a particular culture, they become symbols. Uh, symbolism in erectus tools is therefore crucial evidence as already stated for language's origin. It is true that other species seem to use tools, but that is almost always just exploiting at the moment. So uh, chimpanzees using sticks to get ants and uh, different monkeys using different kinds of tools. A wide variety of creatures use tools, in fact. But uh, Homo erectus was the first creatures to build them according to certain designs, to put certain uh, bits of meaning into the tools and to carry the tools around with them to think about the future and to plan for future environments with their tools. Um, so some of the implications are that the learning of technical skills takes place using a combination of language, gesture, imitation, and guided intervention. And as we see uh, some of the tools that Erectus made, um, we don't believe they could be learned without language uh, based on lab experiments with stone tool learners. Uh, it's surprisingly enough, it takes, uh, even for some, some of the simpler uh, stone tools, it can take graduate students up to 500 hours of practice to learn to make them. Um, and in the Amazon and my research, say with the Banawa making blowguns, children, sons watch their fathers make blowguns and there's very little communication. But at crucial points of the fabrication of the blowgun, the father gives uh, explanations. And uh, some of the tools that Homo erectus made were just as complex as Banawa blowguns. And, um, and many of them were borderline very complex like that. And they would have also required uh, language. We'll see, in fact, experiments in archeological labs uh, tend to support this. So all Persian signs are triadic, composed of three components. So for Perse, any sign, whether it's an icon, an index, or a symbol, has an object, a representation, and an interpretation. So let's take uh, a symbol. Um, so we have an object, let's call it a tree. We're just looking out the window and we see a tree. So we have a representation of this object that society has agreed on, which is the letters or the sounds of the word tree, T-R-E-E -E in the orthography. Um, that's still not enough to have a sign. We, can't, we have to have more than form and an object. We have to also have interpretation. The word tree is linked to the object tree by means of recursive semiosis. So how do I know what a tree is? I, if you ask me, what is a tree? Um, how, do I, how do I give you the meaning? Well, I use other signs. Uh, if, I, if you ask me the meaning of any of the signs that I use to explain the word tree, I have to use other signs. So every sign is interpreted recursively by other signs so that recursion takes place in the brain is not necessarily seen in the grammar per se in the Persian view of semiosis. Although recursion in thought is very important. Uh, and to take one example, I've, I've shown that the Pidaha uh, lack recursion in grammar, but have recursion in thought. Um, and, and that's a significant corroboration of, uh, of Persian semiotics. Icons are physical correspondence that we've seen there pictures, mathematical diagrams, reflection sets, an icon has the features that correspond to the object, even if the correspondence is not drawn directly by an interpreter. But something only becomes an icon as it is interpreted as an icon. That's, that's the case for all signs. They only become signs when they're interpreted. Non-intentional, um, icon has its properties independent of any agent's intentions. The iconic property is in the sign regardless of intent. 
They also show displacement, which is very important for human language um, and displacement representation. Uh, and we find these with Australopithecus africanus even. And we'll see a good example of a 3 million year old icon that was important to Australopithecus africanus. Indexes, just with icons, all animals use indexes. So every animal in the, in the animal kingdom, humans and dogs and monkeys communicate with icons and indexes. Humans communicate more with symbols. In fact, some people would claim that humans are, are the only creatures that have symbols, whereas all creatures use icons and indexes. I think that's a bit strong, but most creatures primarily communicate with icons and indexes. Non-intentional are so. Indexes don't require the intent of an agent. Uh, smoke is there whether there's any agent that wants it to be there or not. Um, these are non-arbitrary and non-conventional. These are just physically caused. Uh, we all need to be able to interpret indexes to survive in the wild. Um, to, uh, uh, street signs are indexes even to survive in a city. We have to be able to interpret icons and indexes. Also indexes show displacement. The smell can be detected even when the fire cannot. And we know that one of the primary uh, features of language is displacement, the ability to talk about things that are not present. So symbols, they're conventional. I prefer not to use the term arbitrary. Symbols are conventional links between objects, um, signs, and interpretants. Uh, they're intentional in form and interpretant. We intend them to, a dog has the, has the uh, form that it does, cachorro in Portuguese, because we've agreed, we have intended for it to have that form, we have intended for it to have that interpretation. And symbols also show displacement. We can use a symbol of a dog when there's no dog around. Symbols are the prerequisites for language. Without symbols, there is no language. In fact, it was interesting that in a recent paper by Elliot Murphy, who is, was writing within the minimalist framework of Chomsky, labels, cognomes, and sickly computation and ethological perspective, he argues, uh, and I would agree completely, that grammar is insufficient to give human language, but that labels of trees, which are symbols, are crucial for to distinguish human behavior from other creatures. So we actually have indexes that are almost four million years old preserved. Uh, so here we have footprints. Um, physically caused by two Australopithecines in Africa discovered by Mary Leakey. These are known as the Laetoli footprints and it's a small uh, Australopithecine child walking probably with uh, its mother. These were uh, preserved in a cement-like substance uh, right after the creatures passed by. So these are indexes that are actually preserved and give us some way some ability to tell something about these relative sizes and shapes and, and upright posture and walking of Australopithecus africanus, and which is uh, this, this person. Australopithecus africanus would have been um, about the size of a chimpanzee, perhaps a bit taller. Some of them were, um, were actually larger. They um, had very small brains compared to modern humans, but they were much more intelligent than chimpanzees. They were, um, habitually upright walkers, um, and they were a very important evolutionary stage. So we have this three million year old icon. This is a small pebble, about five by seven centimeters, uh, found in a cave. The cave is named Makapansgat in South Africa. This is called the Makapansgat pebble, and uh, it's an icon. It looks like a smiley face. <clears throat> we know that it's unlike the stones that uh, were in the cave that the Australopithecus who found it had to carry it for a few miles to get it back to the cave. Uh, it's too large to have suddenly, you know, uh, somehow got stuck between the toes. It was carried deliberately and almost certainly because it looks like a face. So this is the oldest example we have of one creature contemplating an icon. Um, we don't find this kind of behavior with chimpanzees. Uh, Australopithecus, this behavior by Australopithecus represents a cognitive advance. Icons in modern culture are fairly common. Um, we find tools used as symbols as well. A hammer and sickle is uh, two tools that have become very important symbols, um, uh, much more abstract kinds of symbols, but uh, uh, tools are always uh, used as symbols in, in cultures that we know of directly. 
So if, if a creature got symbols, and we still haven't talked about the evidence that they did, but um, if, if let's say that um, a creature has symbols, they have to organize these symbols and they can organize them um, in at least three different ways. They can have what I call a G1 grammar, which is simply symbols arranged in a linear order, um, a linear precedence rules. There's no hierarchy, there's no recursion. And there is evidence to suggest that there are languages spoken in the world today. These G1 grammars are not deficient. You can say anything with a Greek G1 grammar that you can say with a G3 grammar. Mathematically, they all have the same power. It's only experientially and the progress of relative simplicity that distinguishes them. But you, um, it's been proven uh, by, by different people such as Jerry Hobbs and uh, Jeff Pullum, that a G3 grammar, that is a grammar with recursion and hierarchy, um, uh, can all, all the concepts that can be expressed with such a grammar can also be expressed with a G1 grammar. A G2 grammar would be a little bit more complex than a G1 grammar experientially because it would have uh, tree structures, it would have phrase structures and hierarchy, but it would not necessarily have recursive structures. And a G3 grammar would be the kind of grammar that, for example, Chomsky claims that all languages have, uh, which I think is in incorrect, which is a language, a grammar that has both recursion and hierarchy. And, and uh, it's important to remember that in all these grammars, symbols are crucial, grammar is secondary. The form of the grammar is far less important than the ability to produce symbols. Um, erectus icons. So erectus, we find these 300,000 year old icon a uh, phallic icon uh, found in modern day Morocco that was carried around with erectus. So erectus with a more advanced brain uh, also carried around icons and contemplated them and joked around with them, I'm sure. Um, so now let's get into tools and look at the hierarchy of tools and, and the complexity. So we start with the earliest stone technology about three and a half million years ago. Uh, Oldovan technology. There's no imposition of form. You simply strike a rock and get and take a smaller piece and use that as a tool. It's very comp. It's very simple. Even chimpanzees make these kinds of tools. So these these don't represent a massive break in the evolutionary line, but they were used by Australopithecines, chimpanzees, and early humans. But we start to move into the next stage, uh, Acheulean tools. And these were the kind that were used most commonly by Homo erectus, intentional tool forms, hand axes, cleavers, picks, and they were made from 1.8 million to 200,000 years ago. So a refined, that means thinned hand axe from the late Acheulean in South Africa is a fairly impressive, beautiful uh, tool. Um, and it's very complicated to make. And there were a, a variety of these. So um, to make a stone tool, Erectus had to be able to shape the tool, to imagine what the tool should look like, to have the intention to make a tool, to plan for the future. How is this tool going to be used? Should we carry it with us? Are we going to a place that has material to make more tools? And if not, we better carry this with us because they did carry their tools with them for miles. And it shows memory. Uh, they made the tools in a very uh, similar manner uh, across Erectus societies but not always the same. Uh, each, uh, many different erectus groups had their own styles of tool making. So you can, if you're an expert in erectus tools, uh, distinguish say hand axes made in East Africa erectus populations from hand axes made by West African erectus populations. And so um, erectus had a number of inventions and innovations besides stone tools. They had the controlled use of fire, they used wood and bone tools. Um, they had hierarchical planning for pre-shaping block to remove large uh, flakes. Um, and as we'll see, they also uh, almost certainly made boats and traveled on the ocean. Um, so their tools were, were actually sophisticated. If you were um, someone trying to survive on your own in the wilderness, you would not just make one of these tools very easily or quickly. You'd never be able to make one of these tools unless you had been instructed on, on how to make the tool. So we see these going all the way back. And then what we're looking for in particular for tool complexity is hafting, putting a handle on the tool. Um, and there's more and more evidence showing that Erectus also did hafting, which is very important. It shows combinatory thinking, imagining the future. 
that imagining the future is also found in other tools, and it's likely that hafting was invented by Erectus, and it's one of the most significant technological breakthroughs in history. It may not sound like putting a handle on something is a huge technological breakthrough, but it is. Erectus made hand axes. Uh, they made cleavers. All of these tools are different, all of them different sizes, and they had a range of materials that they knew how to work. They made picks. Um, and um, so we go from the Oldowan tools, which were pretty much like those uh, three and a half million year old tools that are made by uh, uh, Australopithecus and by early uh, Homo and by um, uh, uh, even chimpanzees, where you simply strike one rock with another and you get a tool, to Acheulean tools, which are somewhat better developed as the ones we've been seeing. But the ultimate kind of tool, the really uh, fancy tool of the, um, of the lower Paleolithic was the Levallois tools. And they're also found into the middle Paleolithic. Uh, the Levallois technique uh, was more sophisticated. It required a lot of planning. So you took a rock um, and you pounded around the edges of the rock and, and then you pulled out a core from the rock. This takes hundreds of hours of practice and it has been determined in the laboratory even with uh, modern Homo sapiens PhD students in archaeology, that instruction is crucial to successful transmission of the skill of making level WA tools. Here's a good example of a core being taken off or that has been taken off uh, a larger rock. You can see the evidence for the striking along the edges of the tool and then the uh, smaller uh, blade that comes off the tool. This is a very sophisticated uh, process, very, uh, intricate process, takes a lot of learning, hundreds of hours of practice to get this kind of thing. And so about a million years ago, we find Homo erectus using the technology to make these kinds of tools. Um, and there are various uh, necessary conditions to make any kind of stone tool of the Acheulean type or the Levallois Wah type. You need to have certain uh, dimensions that are present. And these are the design imperatives. There's nothing symbolic in these things. These are, if you're going to have a tool, it's got to be like that. What we see in this is just the intelligence of Homo erectus that far surpasses any creature that had ever walked the earth. But then we start to see uh, different types of stylistic change that indicate individuality. They indicate potentially gender. They indicate uh, tools used by um, uh, erectus in different, made by erectus in different communities, so that we start to see the difference of cultures and, and tool dialects, as it were. And in some, there may be evidence of, uh, of dyeing of some of the tools, coloring the tools, which uh, enhances their meaning and enhances their, more personalizes them and, and shows the symbolic behavior. Um, the end of the Acheulean period, um, we still find some of these um, uh, more primitive hand axes, but still much more advanced than Oldovan and still showing symbolic uh, traces. Then about 500,000 to 750,000 years ago, we find shell etchings. This particular shell comes from the island of Java made by Homo erectus long before Neanderthals existed or were in that part of the world and long before Homo sapiens even came about. We see um, intentional uh, marking of a shell with probably with a shark tooth in geometrical designs that uh, that were made without lifting the hand. In other words, this was done in one sitting, somebody making these kinds of marks. And we find a lot of shells like this. We don't know what was intended by the geometrical markings, but we find it on shells, we find it on rocks. So 450,000 year old stone etchings by Homo erectus, we see them experimenting with geometrical shapes. Did this have any meaning? Um, uh, I don't know, it could have just been therapy for whoever was doing it. But we start to see design, we start to see uh, uh, the beginnings of, of representation um, that we hadn't seen in any other species known before the appearance of Homo erectus. We also start to see the first art. Uh, in fact, I got, it, I got interested in all of uh, this and the evolution of the species and our language, because um, after a talk I gave in um, at the universe at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, I visited the Israel Museum and saw this Venus of Barakat Ram, and it said it was at least 250,000 years old, 
And I thought they must have made a typo there. Surely it was only 25,000 years old because this was before Neanderthals, most likely. This is probably uh, um, a statuette that was partially crafted by Erectus 250 to 750,000 years ago. Uh, part of the form is natural. Part of the form seems to have been chiseled and part of the form seems to have been dyed. So we start to see symbolic representation outside of tools in art in, in Homo erectus. Uh, so, so here are some of the implications. The symbolic and social components of Homo erectus tools, they go beyond the functionally necessary to style and meaning. They represent one tradition versus another or one individual versus another. They go beyond icons and indexes. Symbol represent generalizations. Um, and we find that these tool patterns, they generalize over what a tool should be, what a tool means, what a different shape means for the people. Tools are simultaneously indexes of their task. They point to the task. They're icons. They represent other tools. And they're symbols of the values and labor of the community. Once we have symbols and place them in a linear order, we have a language. Productive symbols emerge from culture, which is vital for human language. And once we start to arrange them in a linear order, we have a language. I would argue that uh, there are modern languages like this. It's nothing to do with the people being primitive. It's just one of the many ways that we can organize human language. And again, you can express anything in such a language that you can express in a language with hierarchy and recursion. So having recursion or hierarchy does not make a language more advanced or better in any way. It, it has certain functional advantages in particular kinds of uh, usages, but there's nothing that makes it superior in terms of its ability to express concepts uh, over uh, a G1 language with symbols. The leap to grammar is far smaller than the leap to productive cultural symbols. It's a much easier thing to have uh, a linear order than it is to have the symbols to place in linear order. It's a much easier thing to have uh, branching trees than it is to have labels for the nodes of the trees, that is symbols for what those uh, branches represent. Uh, in this view, there's no need for a proto-language. A proto-language seems to have been based on, on uh, insufficient field research and the idea that all human languages were pretty much the same um, and that we needed to get there to modern languages somehow. But once you realize that modern languages exist and can have plenty of expressive power um, without the features of, say, English or Portuguese, then there's no need for proto-languages. So that's a concept it seems we can do away with. Culture in the sense defined here is the threshold for being able to generate symbols in an open-ended way, the kind that we need to have human language. But surely there's more to modern languages than this. And uh, we can, we can uh, beef up languages, we can make them a lot more complicated. So Luke Steeles has argued that languages um, have at least three components. Language systems, which are systematic domains of vocabulary or grammar, tense, aspect, color terms, number words, this kind of thing. These are the objects. In semiotic terms, these would be the objects. Uh, conceptual systems, uh, the objects that we choose to represent. Uh, conceptual systems are also very important. Pragmatic and semantic distinctions expressible in a language. These are the interpretants in Persis sense. And three, linguistic systems. What are the rules and structure of syntax, morphology, and phonology of a language? These are the forms. All of these are addi additions to symbols plus linear order. None of them are crucial to language. They all have functional benefits, but none of them are design imperatives. So for example, when we add things to symbols, we do what I call enhancement layering. So with intonation, Yesterday, what did John give to Mary in the library? Um, we add intonation to this and we are able to um, uh, more effectively, more easily interpret the symbols. Intonation is a tremendous help. Uh, other aspects of language that are crucial to um, developing uh, uh, easier interpretability of symbols are phonemes, syllables, phonological words, phonological phrases, phonological paragraphs, phonological text, conversational features. And um, in, in my book, I talk about the, how each of these could have evolved naturally from, from symbols 
in linear order. Um, we also get enhancement in grammar, representing grammatic, grammatical uh, grammars hierarchically, which are also somehow in the brain, as uh, Ev, uh, Evelina Federenko has shown in, in her research. So we have to, uh, at some point, it becomes very effective and very efficient to organize grammar hierarchically. It's not necessary, but it does become efficient depending on the culture that's involved. And there are grammatical enhancement levels, morphemes, words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, discourses, conversations. But um, um, I have argued in a number of publications that we need to start with conversations and work our way down rather than starting with sentences. One of the, um, one of the most uh, interesting facts about the evolution of linguistic theory, not the evolution of language, is that at one time, um, uh, linguists would have studied conversations and stories, but at, with the advent of propositional logic, with the advent of the computer, uh, sentences became more interesting. But sentences are, um, are just discourse constituents. They're simply constituents of discourses and conversations and paragraphs, just like a morpheme is a, dis, is a constituent of a word and a word is a constituent of a phrase. So selecting the sentence, um, there are some semantic reasons why that might be selected as the basic unit of analysis, but I think that um, there, there's better evidence that we should start with conversations and consider sentences just one of the many constituents of conversations. So here's a representation of how grammars can evolve. This is from role and reference grammar developed by uh, Robert Van Valen, uh, much simpler kinds of structures uh, that are capable of accounting for anything that any other kind of theory in syntax can account for. And, and we see the layers start to be built up. One of the interesting things about role and reference grammar is the nucleus, the NUC, you see right there in the middle, the nuke, that is the semantic core of the sentence. So in role and reference grammar, each sentence is headed semantically in a sense, not syntactically. It's, there's no X bar theory, for example, required in a role and reference grammar representation. Um, and that seems to fit a little bit more with the um, properties of, of what the core aspect of semiosis in all languages. We use gestures. I mean, one of the reasons that we have intonation and gestures and can't talk without these things is because when we communicate, we communicate with our entire bodies. So there's no sense in which gesture would have preceded um, speech or speech long preceded gestures. Somebody thought one day it'd be great to use our hands while we talk. All animals, if we watch any animal, we see that they communicate with their entire body. Humans are just animals. There's no reason to believe we wouldn't have always tried to communicate with our entire body. So we have facial expressions. We have body uh, postures. We have uses of our hands that all go together with our sounds that we make to, um, to produce symbols and to interpret symbols uh, because we interpret with our bodies. So what other evidence is there for communication? Well, there's, there's travels. Uh, Erectus was all over the world. Um, they were in the Middle East uh, 790,000 years ago. One, one really interesting uh, uh, settlement of Erectus uh, is Gesher Benot Yaakov 790,000 years ago, um, according to many uh, researchers, um, which shows the controlled use of, spy, of fire specialized spaces. Um, so um, they had different activities done in different parts of their living space. This was a Homo erectus colony. They did stone napping, tool use, floral and faunal processing and consumption in one area. They handled meat. And so, so these were organized hierarchically settlements. <clears throat> and this, this has been studied for some time. Uh, this is just above, um, uh, just very close to Galilee here in the modern state of Israel. And this is excavation at Gesher Benat Yaakov, where we find archaeologists who worked there for years finding areas of specialized activity, uh, the controlled use of fire, and actually what it, we would call in any other species of humans um, a modern village. This was uh, made, uh, produced, and occupied over a long period of time by Homo erectus. Homo erectus, interestingly enough, oceans were never a barrier to Homo erectus. So we find Homo erectus on the island of Flores, 700 and 
50,000 years ago, which is down here in the lower part of this map. And Flora is, uh, is interesting because 750,000 years ago and today, it is separated from uh, the mainland. Um, some of this would have been connected by land, but not the island of Flores, by the strongest water, strongest ocean current known, the Pacific uh, throughfare. Um, so they would not have been able to swim to Flores. They would have not, have not have been able to simply ride logs or vegetation. They needed to make uh, ocean going craft to get to Flores. It would have been about the same distance as the English Channel. Um, we find them in Socotra off of Yemen about one, uh, uh, 0.4 million years ago. This is evidence. This is was not visible from land. And um, to get a colony to survive and leave cultural evidence, you need to get about 20 to 40 people arriving about the same time. So in all of these locations where we find evidence of Homo erectus settlements, we have uh, evidence that there were at least 20 to 40 people that would arrive at about the same time. These didn't surf across the ocean on a tsunami or uh, just sit on a log and ride over there. Uh, they had to ha have been more organized that. Um, boats were required. And in fact, uh, Robert Bednarek, an archeologist, a marine archeologist in Australia has actually constructed boats from Acheulean tools that Erectus could have built. And he has sailed them to uh, various of these places. We find Erectus in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in the Mediterranean, in Socotra, in Sri Lanka, in Flores. Um, and I will not be surprised if we find evidence in the future of Homo erectus in California uh, as the first uh, uh, people to have come across uh, the Bering Strait. They were certainly capable of doing that. And there are mysterious settlements in California that seem to be about 150,000 years old, although those are still quite controversial. In any case, uh, David Gill, a linguist that many people will know of, um, wrote a paper some years ago called How Much Language Do You Need to Build a Boat? Or How Much Grammar Do You Need to Build a Boat? And uh, he reached conclusions uh, quite similar to uh, the conclusions that I've also reached independently uh, about uh, the ability to communicate with very little hierarchical syntax, um, but that Erectus would have needed to have at least this amount. We start to see more evidence of symbolization outside of um, of, um, of, of stone tools proper, uh, we find this brightly colored um, hand axe in a burial site of Homo erectus in Spain. It's been called Excalibur because of its color. And uh, there is evidence that it was seen as symbolic uh, perhaps when it was buried. It's very difficult to reconstruct all the intentions that these people had or even some of them, but um, we, we, it's, a, it's a very distinctively colored kind of hand axe that was found with this skull in Spain, uh, which could be a burial site and could indicate symbolism. But um, uh, it's just more evidence that tools were used as symbols. We also find Shonigan spears. Uh, these are, uh, there are some disagreements on the age of these spears, but um, one of the most common ages given is they're 450,000 years old, so they would have most likely been used by Erectus. There are different kinds of spears, thrusting spears and throwing spears, and these show social organization and cooperation and tool making designed to work in a social setting. Um, so these are quite advanced technologically and culturally. Um, so 1.5 million years ago, tools start to show symbolization and tools with a G1 language um, is, is sufficient to have a human language, not a proto language, but an actual human language. Erect is spread out across the world in small hunter gatherer bands. Um, there would have therefore been dialects and cultures of Erectus. Um, tools as cultural products are symbols. Um, in any society today, tools are symbols. Any tool is a symbol. Your, your knife for cutting bread is a symbol. It's not simply a tool, but when you look at it, you, th you think of the bread task. It symbolizes that. It symbolizes the home. It symbolizes comfort. There's a lot of uh, value. And, and those values go into the symbol depending on how the symbol is used in the culture. Um, how old is language? Uh, well, it seems to be about 1.5 to 2 million years old. These, 
the only way we can account for all of the accomplishments of Homo erectus, the simple, I shouldn't say the only way, but the simplest hypothesis is that they had language. And this accounts for their seafaring, their villages, their tools, their uh, survival abilities. Uh, they lasted longer than any other species. Um, and if that's the case, then Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens were born into a linguistic world. We did not invent language. Language did not pop into being with us. But when we were born, language already existed in the world. Um, so if there was one language that originated at one time, it was, it was not 100,000 years ago. It was closer to 2 million years ago. Um, and, and, and these are fascinating uh, uh, ideas. Um, because uh, they, they're they the only explanation. In fact, uh, I often tell people the, the task is not really to prove that Homo erectus had language, but the burden of proof is on the uh, person who would want to establish that they don't have language because having language is simple, such a much simpler hypothesis given what we know about their uh, physiology, their uh, neurology, their culture, their accomplishments. These are a variety of um, australopithecines. Um, and then we finally get to Homo sapiens. Um, I like this particular uh, representation because it shows women instead of uh, men. And so I am going to um, stop there and see if there are uh, questions. We have time for a few questions. Okay, well, uh, I've been asked to do this part in, in English, um, so I'll, I'll switch languages now um, at the request of the, um, the organizers. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Everett for a very stimulating, interesting talk. I think there's, there's a quite a few questions that have been coming through on chat. Um, uh, there, um, I'll select a few uh, questions that have been coming through uh to pose to professor everett now um one which one of the first ones actually that came through is from uh Heito Bafa, and he asks uh professor daniel i would like to know what you think about the sapir wharf hypothesis and linguistic universals in the light of your um analysis of the the origins of language well um Sapir was an interesting person because he looked at the relationship between culture and language in a bi-directional way. If we look at the influence of language on culture, we get what is most commonly known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. If we look at the influence of culture on language, we get what I call ethnogrammar. Um, so both of these, since language and culture form a symbiosis, each one is always affecting the other. Uh, my son, Caleb, uh, has written a book on linguistic relativity, so he's taken on the sapir Whorf hypothesis. Most of my work has been on the uh, other direction, culture affecting language, but they're both uh, very important perspectives to have, and um, we just have to remember that we're, it's a symbiosis. Language did not cause culture. Culture did not cause language, but together, as they began to arise gradually, each shaped the other. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is um, from uh, Anna Mendonça, um, and uh, she has a question relating to Pidaha, and she asks, Professor Dan, uh, is it possible for a Pidaha speaker to acquire a recursive language like Portuguese? Um, and if it is, could we say that the, uh, the capacity of the speaker to produce uh, recursivity is something universal? Um, all people think recursively as far as we know. So that definitely seems to be universal. Um, a Pidaha raised outside the village, and I have met some of them whose first language is Portuguese and who never really lived that long inside the Pidaha community, speak perfect Portuguese. It's nothing to do with mental ability. It's a cultural decision. Uh, Jeanette Sockel, who is my co-author of the uh, field manual, has published two studies on the acquisition of Portuguese by Pidaha speakers. And she has shown that so far, 
um, Pinaha speakers who have raised native Pinaha speakers have not acquired recursive aspects of Portuguese. Their Portuguese grammar reflects their Pitaha grammar. However, if you look at Pitaha stories, they have themes inside of themes, so they can definitely think recursively. It's just important to remember that this was never Chomsky's claim, for example. Uh, his claim was about the nature of language. So um, finding language was without <coughs> recursion um, and I've, I've even produced logical papers on this to show why we cannot say that these are simply exceptions. These are counterexamples to that particular idea, but it is still the case that as far as we know, everyone thinks recursively. Um, okay, um, another question now from... Uh... Luana Lamberti, and um, she asks, if G2, G3, uh, G1, G2, and G3 grammars can equally express the same concepts and ideas, why do you claim that G1 is simpler than G3, for example? Yeah, that's an extremely good question. So mathematically, um, it is not simpler. It is experientially simpler, uh, simply for the fact that uh, if we're talking about what people do, Taking a symbol and putting two symbols after it and remembering that order and keeping them in that order is simpler. It is not mathematically less powerful, but it is uh, cognitively simpler. So when we talk about simplicity, if we're thinking of the Chomsky hierarchy of grammars, uh, G1, G2, G3 do not fit into that hierarchy. They're a different kind of hierarchy of experiencing, experiencing grammars. And, and how to produce utterances with symbols. Okay, thank you for that one. Um, and then uh, Eduardo Mo asks, uh, would such grammatical enhancements be de derived by symbols only? I think maybe he's uh, asking about the, the, uh, the transition between the different grammatical stages. Um, are they derived by symbols only, or could some grammatical aspects also be derived by means of indexes and icons? Oh, we definitely have indexes and icons throughout language. We have onomatopoeia, we have sound symbolism. Language is not just symbols. It is full of icons and indexes and symbols, but so is the communication of all other species full of icons and indexes. What really distinguishes um, human language from all other languages is not the absence of icons and indexes, but the presence of open-ended classes of symbols. Um, okay, uh, another question from João Paulo Bento. He asks, uh, Professor Everett, how can we explain such a jump from simple tool-making processes shared with chimpanzees to a boat? And how, is this how can this explosion be attached to the appearance of language specifically? Okay, so um, as, as I discuss in the book, How Language Began, with four chapters on the evolution of the brain, um, our brains were evolving and getting larger and getting more complex for a variety of reasons. Upright posture, different hunting, um, our, our vulnerability to other kinds of predators once we came down out of the trees. Human brains were just developing. We were getting this great cognitive ability. Since we know that all animals have a couple of symbols at least, and all animals use icons and indexes, as our brains grew more powerful and as we began to uh, have memory leaps that other creatures don't have and be able to remember relationships and develop complex relationships, we began to get names for those things. Uh, so it would have been uh, fairly easy to do. And, but the interesting thing is there, again, we have a symbiosis. Once the, length, once the brain reaches a certain threshold, symbols not only become uh, possible, uh, open-ended symbols, symbol creation, and culture becomes possible, but then the brain gets bigger uh, and the brain gets more powerful until the point where we see modern humans where we're not undergoing so much uh, biological evolution uh, anymore, or neurological evolution. We certainly are undergoing some, but I believe the pace has slackened, and we're mainly undergoing cultural evolution. Um, okay. Um, Anderson Silvapi asks, 
how can we explain ungrammaticality in terms of your proposal from uh, from what uh, in a capacity from what is this in a capacity of humans for recognizing impossible sentences uh, able to um, have evolved or emerged? That's a good question, but I think it's an artifact of particular theories. I don't believe in grammaticality or ungrammaticality. I believe that uh, generative semanticists uh, showed the problems with this notion 30, 40 years ago. What we really need to be talking about is acceptability, unacceptability. Um, and uh, there are certain kinds of things that, that linguists often like to say are impossible. Um, but usually there are very good reasons why they're less uh, effective communicatively and why we don't find those sorts of things. But to start with the idea that uh, let's just imagine a sentence and see if we can find it in any of the world's languages, that might tell you something. But um, grammaticality and ungrammaticality are artifacts of a particular way of looking at language. And many, many linguists uh, prefer to think in terms of acceptability and unacceptability. Um, OK. Um... One more question here from uh, Natalia Zanoni. She asks, uh, Professor, if gestures can be uh, understood as an independent system with their properties, syntax, morphology, um, could those uh, categories of nonverbal communication also have existed and or have been constructed before verbal communication? Uh, that's an interesting idea, and certainly there are there are researchers who believe that. But um, David McNeil, in a three-volume study of uh, sign languages and gestures, has argued, in my opinion, convincingly, that sign languages would not have been the way that human languages started, because once you have a sign language, since they're fully developed human languages, there's really no need for spoken languages. Uh, once you have the capability of a language, uh, spoken is simply more efficient unless there's some sort of pathological reason why you need to use sign languages. Um, so sign languages are fully developed human symbolic systems. Everything I've said about spoken languages applies to uh, sign languages. It's just that spoken languages are more efficient when we're carrying things and trying to defend ourselves from predators. Uh, but gestures are always important. Gestures are not the same as sign language, as everyone knows, but uh, uh, they would have always been a part of it. And sign languages exploited um, the other properties of language to come into being, but I don't think um, that they would have been the first system used. Um, okay, well, with that then, um, we will uh, terminate the, uh, um, the presentation. I'd like to thank um, Professor Everett once again for his very interesting talk and for the people who've uh, participated via the chat and sent their questions in. Um, I've been asked uh, by the organizers at Abraling to uh, thank the Treadle Points um, for their role in the simultaneous translation. Um, and um, no, I hope that you have uh, uh, enjoyed uh, making this presentation and like the comments that have been um, posted up by the, by the, um, by the participants. And uh, at that, for that, I will um, declare that this uh, presentation is closed. Thank you very much. And I hope we'll see you again um, for uh, other presentations here in Brazil um, and um, for everyone else who's listening, um, please come back and watch more things on Abdaling um, Linguist.